So um, our study today is called The Nature Problem and the Remedy. Um, or will be the study for today and tomorrow. Today we will study more about the problem, tomorrow more about the remedy. And now we really, what we studied so far, um, we already looked at in our first presentations about the message of righteousness by faith and like its significance. Then we looked at, at God's character, like that he only wants our best, and that his law and, and his truth are for our best. And we studied how he loves us and how we can love him. And then our last study, um, we started studying about the law of God, uh, which is the foundation because only if we see what God demands, can we seek a remedy. And this was kind of like the introduction or like the foundation. Now we really start with studying the gospel. But we even have to start a bit more with defining the problem, why we need a gospel. That's what we, want, what we want to do today. And what we will see is that the very basic problem, that's where the name comes from, lies in our human nature. And we'll see that actually the gospel have to even start so deep as working in our human nature. Um, but that'll make hopefully more sense as we go along. And maybe the first question is why is it why is it important to study this topic? The thing is, naturally, we are blind to our problem. Um, I think I can never I can never really think of a person, or maybe they have been, but like it's like the like such a small mi minority who just without the Bible or anything just in the world have realized that they have a really big problem. Uh, or realize the problem the Bible says we have. And that's actually a pretty strong, pretty strong sign that we're actually very blind, blind to our problem. So it's actually very good to study it. Um, Jesus talks about this in Mark 2, verses 16 and 17. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? Then Jesus heard it. He said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's kind of interesting. Jesus was like eating probably with tax collectors, maybe prostitutes and other very obvious sinful people. Because the tax collectors were normally like um, robbing the people by fraud. And now the Pharisees come to him and ask him, why do you eat and sit with these people? Like they would never have done that. And it's interesting, Jesus tells them, I eat with them because they are in need of a physician, they are sick. Well, now let me ask you do, you, do you not think that the Pharisees would have a problem too? Probably, like, or actually, we can know they had a problem too. They were maybe even sometimes even guiltier and they had greater problems than the tax collectors and sinners. So that Jesus even said to the Pharisees, that the tax collectors and prostitutes rather go into the kingdom of God than the Pharisees. So what really this shows, really all humans need a physician. But like many as the Pharisees and scribes only think that these people need a physician, but they don't. And only they wouldn't associate with these people who think they are, or whom they think they're sinful. But actually they need it a physician much more, or even the same as a tax collectors and sinners, but they were not aware of it. And when we're not aware, we cannot seek a solution. Paul also further points us out in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 10, where he says, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Now the reality is that Paul was always weak as every other human. So what does he mean when he was weak, like when he was aware of his weakness? 
because only when he was aware of his weakness, then he could be strong by relying upon Christ. So actually studying our weakness helps us better to see our inability that we can seek a remedy. And actually one of the key things about success in the gospel and living righteously is to constantly stay aware that you are in need. Because it's actually very easy as a Pharisee to kind of lose sight of that, especially when things are going very well. And you might be saying, oh, I conquered this bad habit. I'm doing good here. And you might start feeling, oh, and then like your sense of dependence to Christ starts like getting a little bit less. Or just you completely even lose sight of it. So our strength really lies, even when things are going well, to always keep in mind that it's not because of us, but of Christ. and the moment we again start losing sight of him and not depending upon him, we actually again have a problem. So it's actually very important to study, even also intellectually, what is our problem. Because when we know the truth, it will help us even when our feelings and our logic doesn't tell us that we are weak. We can still by faith say the Bible says I'm weak, so that Bible will believe I'm weak and therefore I will seek Christ. That's so important to know this topic. Now the fundamental problem, now we really start with the problem, that was just a little intro. The problem of sin is that we will see it's two problems, it's a twofold problem. The Bible says sin is a transgression of the law. Or it's like the transgress, like you might know it like if you, if somebody has property, and you go on the property, you're transgressing, so you're entering in a different region. So sin is and leaving the law, the property of the law, and going into another property around the law. Like you can think of the law as like, like the city, and if you leave the city, you're transgressing, you're going outside. And then outside that sin. So actually, transgression really means just not doing what the law says. This is sin. Transgression is just an old word to describe that. So God has this law, and he cannot change this when people have transgressed it to accommodate their sin, because then he would stop being just. And the penalty for breaking this law is eternal death. That says in Romans, for the wages of sin is death. So the first problem, which sin has brought is that in our past we are guilty from transgressions and we need pardon for many christians this is almost all of the gospel because then they say jesus died for us and that's the solution that's true but that's not all because there is actually a second problem next to guilt which needs to be solved which is as important and today we want to probably look more into the second problem because the first problem probably like we're familiar with that. But before that, we, we also have to look at one more thing because last time we studied the law and many people might even agree that we study it's like, that's like good morals. That's like, that may make sense and it's very good. But people might even say the law is good and what, what the Bible says, all right. But this might not go so far to actually say that what the law says, we actually have to do to be saved. They might say, yes, it's nice. But through the gospel, we don't no longer have to keep the law. Keeping the law is not like needed if you want to be in heaven. Well, let's see whether the Bible actually agrees with this. In 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, it says, do you not know? that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. So it's interesting. The unrighteous, those who break the law, will not inherit the kingdom of God or will not be in the kingdom of God. And apparently that was a danger that the Corinthians would be deceived. So Paul says, do not be deceived. Don't think that the unrighteous will inherit the kingdom of God. They will not. And he goes on, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. 
And there are many verses to this actually. So in Revelation, there's another one, Revelation 22. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and have a loss and practice a lie. So it's like a contrast, like those who can go into the new Jerusalem are those who do his commandments. And outside are the ones who in whatever area don't. So we can see the same, like only commandment keepers will be in heaven. Only the righteous law-abiding overcoming people will be in heaven. Or in Revelation 2, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Or you might say, only those who overcome shall not be hurt by the second death. Jesus says also the same in the Gospels. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. That means like normally Christians would say like, call Jesus their Lord. But he says, only calling me Lord, Lord, utterly is not enough. But he says, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me that they, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? I'll declare to them, I've never knew you depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So that's even, even more striking. Jesus says, only those who do the will of his Father, and that's the law. And he actually even says it will be people on that day who will say, have we not like done many even religious things, even like good works, like cast out demons, prophesied, and done wonders in your name? But he says, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Lawlessness is like lawless. So it's like a person without the law or somebody transgressing the law. So he's saying, even like this awkwardly good things, if you're not keeping the law in any particular particular. I don't know you and depart from me. And here's the last verse. But whoever keeps his word, uh, keeps his word truly, the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who abides, uh, he who says he abides in him, ought himself also to walk just as he walks. So he, whoever claims to be in Christ, it will be seen that he walks as Christ walked. I mean, Christ lived a righteous life. He walked righteously. And here's also one last one from the spirit of prophecy. That's about Jesus. He knew that unless there was a decided change in the principles and purposes of the human race, all would be lost. So that's like Jesus as a young person looking at the people around him and he was realizing, unless in the heart of my mom and of my brother, like the neighbor over there, and like this person, they're owning this little shop here in Nazareth selling like goat skin and all these other people, unless there's a decided change in the principles and purposes of their heart and life, they all will be lost because they're all falling short. And he was really burdened by this. But, but the idea is here, like, it's not just enough to have guilt pardoned. There needs to be decided change in, human, in, the, in the human being to be saved. We not only need pardon for our past sins, but right doing in the present life as well, if we want to be in heaven. But now the thing is, this is very true. We have to face this idea. But we will also see that the law can't make righteous too. For example, it says in Galatians, for if righteousness or right doing comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Like then Paul's making like this hypothetical statement, like if it would come through the law, Christ would not have died. But like Christ died, so we can know it doesn't come through the law. Or in Galatians at another point, for as many as of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, curses everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. 
Now, maybe you've wondered what this is, why it's, it's a bit strange at the first reading. For at first, it sounds like those were well, the works of the law. That sounds like they're, they're keeping the law. But he says they're under the curse, or they're under condemnation, or they're there in sin. That's what this means. Because he, and he um, gives the evidence or the proof of this, quoting now this verse from the Old Testament, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So actually the people who are of the works of the law, they were not actually doing all the things of the law. Otherwise they wouldn't be cursed because only those people are cursed who don't do all things in the law. What he's actually saying is that even people trying to keep the law in their own strength they're also under condemnation because they don't actually really keep the law. I thought it might look like that they have works of the law. And later he continues, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But it's not like, it's like if, if there would have been a law, but, but there's not a law like this. The law cannot give us a new life. It can only point out the problem. Let's even turn to Isaiah 64, verse 4. Um, and here again, it's not only I, I invite somebody of you help to read this verse. Isaiah 64, verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard not perceived by the ear, neither has the eye seen, or God because the what he has prepared for him that waited for him. Actually, sorry, I realized I gave the wrong reference here. Um, it's Isaiah 64, um, verse 6. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's verse 6, not verse 4. So Please read one verse or two verses later, verse six. Isaiah 64, verse 16. Okay. Oh, okay. Isaiah 64, verse six. Thank you, Lisa. But we are all as unclean things. And all our our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf in our iniquity, that the wind has taken us away. So it's actually very interesting this verse. Um, okay, Paul, look, let's let's take let's have a careful look in the verse. It doesn't read all our sins are like filthy rags. I think it says all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Like in righteousness, this means like our right doings. So not only like the obviously wrong things are bad, but it says even our righteousness is eyes filthy rags. Our right doings, our, our, our own law keeping is as filthy rags, like as defiled, unacceptable, unclean, dirty clothes. Like that's what this means, like the, the rags. It's like clothes being dirty clothes. Actually, it means in the Hebrew, like with blood on it. So let's think of that not only the righteous or the bad things are wrong, but even like the righteous works humans can do of themselves, just if they just have the law and just do it, it it's not righteous too. And here Paul says it in Romans also, for what the law could not do, in, in that it was weak through the flesh. And he's talking about making us righteous. And here we already have a clue why the law couldn't do this, or why we not just simply read the law and just go and do it, because it was weak through the flesh. And flesh in the New Testament normally talks about human nature. Like human nature is like, like maybe like a bit theoretical term, uh, it really just means 
like the way we are humans. So like human nature means how a human is made up, how a human is, like the nature or like the structure of the being of a human being. That's what human nature means. So like an angel, he's different from us. He has an angelic nature. But we as humans, we have a human nature that's like our body and also including our mind, like a whole person. But like, not just my own, but like every human being has like the same one. Like that's like the one thing which all makes us human, that we have a human nature. This was meant with the flesh. So our weakness or our inability to keep the law actually lays in the way we are humans. Our nature prevents us from doing good. Now to understand this, let's start with man's original nature in the when God created man. In Genesis it says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And that's amazing, like God, the creator, having been divine, says, now let us make man in our image. Now, it probably also meant that God made man, like in a sense, similar to him in an outward appearance. Like, for example, in Danny, you can read about God being like a man with white hair. Um, but there's probably more men, or there's more men than just physical look. It also means that God's mind and attitude and character was in the newly created pain. Like not only did they look in a way similar like God, but they were thinking like God. Their attitudes were like God. They were acting like God. And their hearts and motives were like God. And their thoughts were like God. So even if you would just have not seen them, you maybe just have talked to them, you would have been reminded of God of the way how he talks, of the way he thinks, the way how he do things. But then something happened. And then even it was that they actually by nature could keep the law because their nature was righteous. And they could just stay, they could actually just read the law and just simply go and do it. But when they fall, something happened. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, Paul says, I fear lest somehow as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So he actually, Paul is more talking to the Corinthians, but in this you can actually learn something about what happened in the temptation of the tree. That actually the serpent, by his craftiness or like deceitfulness, corrupted the mind of Eve. And actually what Satan did when he was talking to Adam and Eve, or especially to Eve, he was now with the thought of God in their mind when they were created, and they were thinking like God, and they were both the words and actions of God. Now Satan talking to them and Eve believing that, they allowed actually the thoughts of Satan to come into their minds. They were, their minds were corrupted. And actually the thoughts of Satan came into their mind and therefore they actually had a new mind. The fall of man corrupted the mind of man from the likeness to God to the likeness of Satan. Man had in the beginning the mind of God, but after the fall, the mind of Satan. You can see this change. Before they ate from the tree, there was just harmony. God was like visiting them. They liked to be in his presence. There was no arguing between them. They didn't blame each other. They were like holy and like God. But now after the tree, it's completely opposite. Like you have to like read it like carefully, but you can see it. They started blaming God. Like Eve said, like the, the snake you made, she gave me to eat. And they blamed each other. Adam said, oh, the wife which you gave me, she gave me to eat. So she was, he was blaming Eve and God. And they also avoided God's presence. Where formerly they just liked to be in his presence. Like they were like making, running away and hiding and making like the victims. And they actually made kind of excuses for sin. Like 
I said, actually, like, look, you gave, you created the serpent, you made Eve, and they tempted me. And I ate, like, first all the others, and then Adam himself. So he's kind of pushing it toward the others, and because God made them, he's actually pushing it toward God. And you see, what at the heart of this was that now there was enmity. Enmity is like an old word for, like, being the enemy of somebody or being at war with somebody. Then you had enmity. And rebellion against God was now there because the mind of Satan had come into them. Like Satan in heaven started blaming God, blaming others. Eventually he was excluded from heaven. He makes excuses for sin. And he is in rebellion against God and not keeping the law of God. And this very attitude of Satan and now come the human attitude. And they no longer reflected the image of God. Outwardly, in a sense, but inwardly, they lost the image of God. And they were actually now reflecting Satan in their behavior. And now that was actually a drastic change in, in how man was. Now his mind was like not as before, like trying to bless others and being nice to the animals, plants, um, and then obeying God and worshiping him. Now they were actually like hating each other, hating God, and being selfish. And that's actually now the and that's that's a very humanity, the way how humans are naturally are, which Adam and yeah, passed on to all his children, and they again passed on to their, their children up to our generation. That's the very nature every one of us has inherited. Now let's look on further how this nature is now of man after the fall. And the Old Testament, it talks about it. Even in Genesis, it says, and I will put in the tree between you and the woman. That's actually even the gospel, because you hear Satan or through the serpent, and the woman talks, it's like meaning the believers in Christ. And it's interesting, God promised you that I'll put enmity or war between the believers and Satan. And when God has to put it there, actually it means that before he puts it there, it has not been there. In other words, Satan and the people the humans were actually in agreement. They were in like a union. They, they were just friends and allies. That really what, what happened. Would, if God would have not intervened and put the actually supernatural enmity in the heart of man against Satan, humans would never again have any wish to seek after God. They would, been a, they would stay the captives of Satan. So actually it shows us this naturally in the human heart there's actually enmity against God and love for Satan. Only when God, through the gospel, now puts the enmity against Satan and love to God, this is actually um, how it can be saved. But naturally, we have enmity against God and love to Satan and his principles and for self. Also in Isaiah, I hope you can read it, this very devastated state is described. Why should you be stricken again? God is here talking to Israel. You will revolve more and more. So God is saying, why should I send more judgments to correct you? It will all not help. You will just continue to revolve. The whole head is sick. And the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and Putrefying source. Like God is using like here like the, the metaphor, like he's describing the state of, of humans in sin, with like a person being lacerated with like open wounds all over from like head to bottom. Like there's no sound, there's no help. Everything is just filled with like sickness and death and like dying tissues. They have not been loosed or closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. And here in Jeremiah, which is all through the same idea, just presented from different angles. God here says, 
can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Like an Ethiopian means like a person with black skin. And you might have seen the leopard like yes, like on this, like the spots. Now, now can he do it? Can like a leopard change the spots? Or can like a black skin person like make his skin like a white skin person? Or can a Malaysian skin person make their skin like a black skin person? Or can a European make his skin like a black person or like any way around? No. So what God is actually saying, he's actually saying it's something impossible. Can the Ethiopian change the skin of the leopard to spots? No. Then may you also do good who are accustomed to the evil. So if they could, you could also do good, but they can't, so you can't do good who are accustomed to the evil. Let's read Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. I also here invite one of you to ask one of you, please read that verse for us. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, it says, um, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayst live. Thank you. Now, according to that, it's a little bit similar um, as, um, as what we read in Genesis. So what is this verse actually implying what God has to do? Like what does this verse imply how we are before God does something in our lives? What what do you think can we learn from this verse? You can just read over it again, think of it and yeah I'm, I'm sure and you'll you'll find it. It's not very like difficult. Maybe I ask, um, according to this verse, can we love God just by ourselves? Like if we could, God wouldn't have to circumcise our hearts to do so. So we can actually see here that um, in the state of human nature before conversion or before God does something, we cannot even love God ourselves. Even loving God, God has to do that for us. Which, when I read that, really surprised me because I never thought of it like that. And the same thing in what we've seen is like also presented in the New Testament. Here in Romans, Paul talks about it a few times. Here in Romans 3, he's like making this long statement what then are we better than they talking about like the gentiles not at all we have previously charged both jews and greeks that they are all under sin as is written there's none righteous no not one you might even think oh like um i'm i'm righteous but like naturally no there's not one there's not one who understands like spiritual things naturally like we might understand science but like not spiritual things naturally there's none who seeks after god so even naturally we don't seek after god we're like adam and eve running away from god and don't wanting to do with him so even seeking god must be some supernatural work happening in us they are all turned aside they have together become unprofitable there's none who does good no not one You can probably skip the rest, but Paul is making an absolute statement. There's not one human who is doing good, at least without Christ. And nothing can change it. Like it's not like saying, like, you just try harder, or just get a good education, or if you just have a really good discipline, you you might get it done. 
No, he says, there's none who does good. No, not one. And in Romans 6, he actually calls them slaves of sin. And then Romans 8, he goes so far and says, a carnal mind, that's not the new mind which came into humanity through the fall. That's the mind of Satan. He says, it is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. And it says even nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And it's really like, it's, it's not saying like, maybe you can just do something and then they might do it. If the, as long as they're in the flesh, they cannot do it. But we actually, but we read that somehow there must be a way to keep the law. We'll see how that goes later, but so far, it's important to see that naturally, every human being, we, even every one of you, me, no one on this world can claim like an exemption from this is naturally an enmity against God. And this mind we naturally have is not subject to the law of God, and it cannot be. Nothing can be done to that mind itself. It cannot be modified or rearranged or fixed. The only way which you will see is actually to abolish this mind and give a completely new mind. But you cannot take like the broken scene and kind of fix it. You have to just throw it away and have some new mind. You can skip over that. If you want, you can read that later. But we can read this in John 8. Jesus again here talking to the Pharisees. And he said, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So... That was Jesus saying to them, and it's kind of implying if the truth will make them free, that they actually had bondage. And the Pharisees understood that he was actually implying this, and so they, they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you'll be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And the slave does not abide in the house forever, but the son abides forever. He's talking, those who are slaves to sin, they will not abide in the house of God or heaven forever. Only those who are not set free will abide. And then he says, therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Now let's understand this more with this last verse on this topic in 2 Peter 2 verse 19. What has really happened that every human being now is actually in bondage, at least everyone unconverted. And let's look there in 2 Peter 2 verse 19. And if someone of you wants to read, please go ahead. Peter 2 verse 19, while they promise them liberty, they are themselves are the servants of corruption, for a whom a man is overcome, of the same is still brought in bondage. Oh, sorry, I actually gave the wrong reference. Um, sorry, actually, I think it's, I have to have a look myself, one moment. <laughs> It is in Peter, but I think it might be the first letter to Peter, and the first um, first epistle of Peter. Um, oh no! Oh, sorry, I was actually right. Um, uh, I then misunderstood if all the connection was a bit wrong. It's 2 Peter 2 verse 19. I might read it again. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. So when Adam and Eve were overcome by Satan, they were brought into bondage to him. And this is actually the state of all humans who are not have been made free by Christ. I thought they might realize it, they might think they're free, and they might even do things, 
still there's a way in how they are slaves, how they are in bondage to sin. And that God may can do like this outward like righteous works of their life. They cannot really be fully free. They, there are some things which they cannot do. Much of their daily life they can do and so they don't realize that they're slaves. But the certain things which they cannot do, if they would start trying to do them, they would actually realize that they're in bondage and that they cannot go so far. You can like imagine like if you would be in prison and if you just be having like your, your cell, you'd be sitting on your bed. If you just be sitting there all day reading or thinking or maybe in prison people would watch television or so on, you might not so much realize that you are actually in bondage. But actually, the stronger you will start to escape from the cell, the more you will realize that you're in bondage. The more you realize the chain holding you, the doors where you cannot go through, the window being barred with iron. And even the harder you try to escape, the more you will actually realize how much you're in bondage. And that's so with humans. When they just have their normal, daily, regular life, they're just like content. They just don't realize it. But if they actually start now taking the Bible and following what the Bible says, they'll actually realize that they're in bondage. They cannot really do just what the Bible says, naturally. But now someone might object, but aren't there some good people who aren't even Christian? That would be actually probably, like, it would seem like a good objection. But let's look what Jesus says in Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, the outside of them may be clean also. So you're saying like, outsidely, you seem righteous. If you seem very righteous, but inside they're full of extortion and self-indulgence. It's kind of the answer to what we looked at. Like many people in this world, oddly, they kind of seem kind of righteous, but inside they are not. Now, why the saying again steps to Christ? It is impossible for us of ourselves to escape from the pit of sin in which we are sunk. Our hearts are evil, and we cannot change them. Education, culture, the exercise of the will, human effort, all have their proper sphere, but here they are powerless. And that would be probably if you ask a wealthy person, how can we improve the world and make it better? They might probably tell something of this education for the poor, more culture, more art, more human effort. And we, if we all just like, yeah, yeah, really determined to do it, like we just all have to get ourselves together and just really will fix this society. If we would all just choose to do it, we could do it. That's probably what people in the world would tell you. And all this have a proper sphere, but to cleanse the heart, they are powerless. And she goes on, they may produce an outward correctness of behavior, but they cannot change the heart. The only one who can change the heart is Christ. And then she says in the last sentence, the idea that it is necessary only to develop the good that exists in man by nature is a fatal deception. Like our nature, our mind, nature and mind are almost like synonymous. You cannot modify it. You cannot like fix it. You cannot like remedy it. You have to abolish it and replace it. So like you can imagine it like that humans for unconverted, it's a bit like a line and you can teach a line certain nice tricks. And you might even be able to go into the cage of the lion if he don't kill you, but he's still a lion. And at the right occasion, you will realize that he's still a lion. Now, people having like a lion and training him and many years it went well. And they thought like he would never attack me. But at some point the lion attacked and killed that person. I think I heard a story like this. And that's like the world, like the people might seem very nice, but they're still lines at heart that they're not with Christ. 
And at just the right occasion, you will realize that if you just dig a little bit deeper into society, you will see that you don't have to dig very deep to see how much people are lying. Lines and hearts are not lines. Someone might also say, but why then is not the world full of crime and evil? No, just look around. It actually is. And you just have to watch the news. The other thing why people might not realize it is that they're actually very blind. If you're not really knowing the law and how things could be, you just think that what you see around you is just normal life on this planet. Like that this world is just like this grayish life, that there's no perfect good. You might say there's no perfect evil. That's just how things are. If you don't know that there's actually a better, so much more beautiful way, like a white way. If you don't know that way, you just say, oh, they're just normal. And you're very blind then. And there's lots of outward correctness, which also kind of make it hard sometimes for people to actually really confess that what the Bible says is right. Because I think, oh, I'm doing pretty well. Like, I'm not so evil at heart. Okay, I'm doing a lot of good things. But actually, they're, they're also blind. They don't just look to the outward correctness. And lastly, also, there's the restraining spirit of God, working even on unconverted converted people, restraining them and prompting them to do certain good works. There will come a time where God's spirit is withdrawn from all who are not converted, and then, like, hell will break loose, and Satan will have perfect control over everybody. But we're not there yet. That will come, but not yet. Right now, there's still the Spirit of God working on this world, restraining people from manifesting all of this wickedness which is in their hearts and cruelty and selfishness and even prompting them to do certain good works. And lastly, there are also some people who might have never heard of Christ, but their hearts still responded to God's Spirit. Like maybe somebody heathen living on a jungle island, or there might even be people in the Western world. So that's why we don't really often might think it's not so bad as the Bible really says. But if we really face it, if we also have our eyes enlightened by the Holy Spirit, we can see it's so bad. It's really so bad. And, and to be honest, the older I get and the longer I'm the Christian, the more I see how this is so true. And like the people around us, the underlying thing of the unconverted is selfishness. It might manifest in a thousand different ways, but it's still the truth. And this world would be completely different if the hearts, all of them would be changed. Now we're also almost done for today. We just want to look at a few more things. Now, what about the man in Romans 7? Like, let's read about him. Like, this is often sometimes brought up. Here it's in Romans 7. That's why it's the man of Romans 7. And Paul's probably here describing his own experience while he was still a Pharisee. And he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. For what I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. So he is now a man, and it's like something in between. He's not fully as a person in the world, but he's not as a Christian with a new heart. He wants to do good. He actually realized that the sinful way that's bad, and he actually hates it. He says, but what I hate, I do. So he wants to do good, but he doesn't. And he actually does agree even with the Christian principles of morality. They are good. The law is good. But he's then saying, but now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. And the thing is, when saying Christian, there might be actually even many Christians who have this experience. And he goes on, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, 
warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my madness. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So his mind, like the law, but something in his nature, in his body, was like bringing him into captivity, into slavery, to sin. And I can say in my own experience, when I, when I learned the Adventist doctrine, at first, I was not really taught the gospel much. I only learned like the doctrines and the law. And I like the law. It's like, it's such a good law. It makes sense. Like, if you think about it, like, that really makes sense that God says, keep this law. But if everybody would keep it, it would be wonderful. But then the more I learned, the more earnest I tried to keep it, I realized what this man in Romans 7 is saying. Like, I, I delight in the law. I will to do it. But I find another law in my members that the harder I try, the more I realize that I'm not really doing it, that I can produce an outward correctness of behavior, but I cannot change my health. How we can get away from this real study tomorrow. But this is actually like the state how conversion begins, that we seek a solution. Our wagon is also commenting on this in the book, Christ and his righteousness. And because of time's sake, we can just maybe read this last sentence, which is underlined. The bondage of sin of which the apostle complains in the seventh of Romans is not the experience of a child of God, but of the servant of sin. Like if, if this is our experience that we want to do good, but can't, we find an other law in our members or in our body, keeping us in bondage to sin. We are not yet this a child of God. We are still a servant of sin. We are not yet converted. We are convicted and the Spirit of God is working with us. It's not hopeless, but we're not yet converted. And it's, it's so interesting to look at this person. Like he had, had knowledge of the law, even had a deep hatred of sin. Like he, means he had con repentance. He was probably confessing his sins. And there was a recognition of his own desperate condition of sinfulness. And he even had a firm decision to serve the Lord. And he was actually putting forth the utmost effort to do that. But still, something was missing. Like if you look on this, like I'd be a really, really good Seventh-day Adventist. Like he wants to serve the Lord. Like, yeah, everything Al White says in the White, I will do it. Let's go do it. Like, let's do evangelism. And he was really, he was not just saying this, he was actually really putting forth his effort. He was investing his time, working hard. But like he was actually, he had to say, the good which I want to do, at least inwardly, I cannot do. Maybe outwardly I, I evangelize and change my habits and lifestyle. But I have to, if, I, if I'm honest, I have to confess in my heart. I'm still selfish. I'm doing it not because I love the others so much, but rather because I'm fearful and want to save myself. And that's selfish. I'm not doing it because of others, but of myself. And I'm not really having this love which Christ wants me to have. I'm rather coldish. I'm rather a cold religion. But like outwardly, he was like repenting. He was convicted. He was consecrated. He was confessing his sins. But what was missing? And we will see what was missing was faith. But we will study that later. But there are actually people who are like this. And what they need to understand how by faith now something or God now wants to help them, how it actually really works. That's like a bit much, but that's like a, from a book called um, Living Righteously. It was like an excellent summary of Romans 7 and 8. Like in the first chart, it's like before Romans 7, that's like the natural person without God. Then during the Romans 7 experience, that's like the person being described. And Romans 8 is like a converted person or a Christian. And let's read through it. Like the first person, you just read it like one line from left to right. The first person is without the law of God in truth. He doesn't really see like the spirit of the law. And he thinks in himself pretty righteous. Now, during Romans 7, he knows the law of God and truth. 
in Romans 8, he knows the very spirit of the Lord. Before Romans 7, there's no delight in the law. During Romans 7, he delights in the law, in the mind. In Romans 8, he delights in the law in mind and heart. Before it, he has no conviction and is self-satisfied. Then he starts being convicted and repentant. And the same also in Romans 8. In Romans 7, he's in bondage but doesn't know it. In Romans 7, then he is in bondage and knows it. In Romans 8, he's free from the power of sin. In Romans 7, he's still under condemnation. Or he's under condemnation. During the experience, he's still under condemnation. In Romans 8, there's no condemnation. Before Romans 7, he's not justified. During Romans 7, he's still not justified. In Romans 8, we are set free, he's justified. And you can just kind of read through, maybe we can just catch a few things. In Romans 7, he's not born again. During Romans 7, he's still not born again. In Romans 8, he's born again. Before Romans 7, he's unrighteous. During Romans 7, he's still unrighteous. Only then in Romans 8, he's righteous. In Romans 7, he's in both cases in the flesh. In Romans 7, he's now in the spirit. And then also the one is, is not a son of God. While he's still in bondage, he's still not the son of God. But then Romans 8, he's a true son of God. Before Romans 7, he is under no covenant with God. In Romans 7, he's under the old covenant. In Romans 8, he's under the new covenant. And we'll study what that means. And really the summary in Rome, before Romans 7, there's no salvation. In Romans 7, he still has no salvation. But then in Romans 7, uh, Romans 8, he has salvation. Having looked at this, we also can see that even if a person now wants to do good, and not only just like this natural, unwilling, blind sinner, even then he's still a sinner. And he's still not there. He's, he made a good step forward, a very important step forward. And, and he's not beyond hope. But he's still not yet there. Romans 7 is not the experience of a real Christian, of a converted Christian. Maybe of a professed Christian, but not of a converted Christian. And maybe if, if that's your own experience, don't give up to despair, but ask God, as I my past, ask him to teach you how you can get away from this. And study the Bible with the zeal to know. And God will teach you there's a way out. As we were study in the beginning, the law can be kept, but only those who keep it, who gain this, this hidden experience, which is there, which you cannot from the surface find, but which you really have to ask God to teach you to find it. It can be found. And then there's actually a way to escape and to keep the law. Alright is just confirming all of this. We, we might just read a few sentences. Maybe you can skip the first one. You can, if you want, read it later. Yeah, down here she says in Steps to Christ, we have flattered ourselves as did Nicodemus that our life has been upright and our moral character is correct and think that we need not humble the heart before God like the common sinner. But when the light from Christ shines into our soul, we shall see how impure we are. We shall discern the selfishness of motive, the enmity against God that has defiled every act of life. Then we shall know that our own righteousness is indeed as filthy rags. Calvite says about what happened with human nature when man fell. His nature became so weakened through transgression that it was impossible for him in his own strength to resist the power of evil. And she says here, Christ is a source of some right impulses, no, of every right impulse in us. He's the only one that can implant in the heart enmity against sin. Without that, we love sin and there's no right impulse. Every desire of truth and purity, every conviction of our own sinfulness is an evidence that his spirit is moving upon our hearts. She says he in Christ object this and everything that we of ourselves can do is defiled by sin. And here two last statements. The first one for ministry of healing. 
The good resolutions made in one's own strength avail nothing. Not all the pledges in the world will break the power of evil habit. Never will man practice temperance in all things until their hearts are renewed by divine grace. So that means we don't have even self-control to the absolute sense till we are renewed by divine grace. And she says we cannot keep ourselves even after from conversion from sin for a moment. Every moment we are dependent upon God to keep us. The law, and then here's the last statement and thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. The law of God is as holy as he is holy. As perfect as he is perfect, it presents to man the righteousness of God. It is impossible for man of himself to keep this law. For the nature of man is depraved, deformed, and wholly unlike the character of God. So as a summary, and that's, that's a closing part for today. Without Christ, there are no good people. Everything they do is sinful and offensive to God. In ourselves, we can't keep the law. We are in bondage to Satan. We don't naturally love and cannot produce love even towards God. Every good impulse and attraction in us is to God comes from him, not from us. In ourselves, we wouldn't see God. We have natural enmity against God and no interest in him unless we yield to his spirit working upon us. We don't naturally love the truth, but hate the truth. And in summary, we, we are selfish and want to be like God and be worshipped because that's, that's Satan's mind in heaven. He wanted to be like God and wanted to be worshipped. That's still the mind in humans today that they're unconverted. If you really think about it and think about humanity, you will see that this is true. Like if you look at the picture, like some people really let themselves be treated as almost that would be like some special type of person, almost like God. And how people like adore certain stars or um, celebrities, that's almost like worshipping them. And the people accept that. They accept things which only God should have. And before conversion, we have the mind of Satan. We have a free will, but normally we not wish to do what is good. And even if we want to do now with the will to do good, we don't have the power to carry it out. Humans cannot change themselves truly. Why, however, they can produce some outward correctness of behavior and also technological progress without Christ can kind of hide a little bit the depravity of humanity. But if you just look a little bit deeper into society, it's still everywhere. And the good things which humans do without God are to their own glory and self-esteem or to feel better than others. Like people do good things, like they help the poor, or be nice, but if they really would see how it is, they would just do it to like, to be proud. Of them to their own glory, that people look, oh, that's a nice person, to their own self-esteem and to maybe even feel better than others. Like, I'm not like this person over there. I'm like doing those, all these things. And all this is transgression of the law and the very, very opposite of righteousness. And all this can never enter heaven because it's the very opposite spirit of heaven. The very opposite is needed to enter heaven. So somehow this problem needs to be solved because God even said that the keeping the law is, is necessary to be in heaven. So there must be a way how to do it. Otherwise, God would ask us to do something impossible and he will never do that. But in ourselves, we can't. In the next studies, we will study how. But we first have to really face that we can't. And really, in essence, there have to be a change in us. We have to become good before we can do good. And tomorrow we will study our only remedy.